Hi, I'm Ed Kohler with Extreme Networks, and I'm here to talk to you about our world-class multicast solutions run over Fabric Connect. We can provide some of the highest scale, most stable network infrastructures for multicast on the face of the globe. Some of the largest video surveillance networks, whether they be in stadiums, airports, transit authorities, use this technology not only for its stability and security, but also for its scalability as well. But how does the fabric do this? How can we replicate multicast traffic to such scale? That's what this video is about. And I want to bring our attention back to the concept of tandem replication. And we're going to use a simple broadcast scenario in order to set the stage for what I'm going to be talking about. If you will recall, we created something called a multicast backbone MAC address. And that included a special identifier to identify the fact that it is a multicast frame. But then also, we took information and embedded it into that actual address. Things like the actual sortist path source ID, which gives us the source, and then also the ICID information, which gives us the reverse path forwarding tree. Now, in this scenario, we're going to use a very simple type of process called address resolution. And in this case, we have network address 10.10.10.10, and it's looking for 10.10.10.12. Now, as you can see, we have a common community based on ICID 1000, and VLAN 100 is associated at three points in the network with ICID 1000. You can also see that this is a subnet of 10.10.0/24. We have two other stations. We have 10.10.10.11 and 10.10.10.12. In this instance, 10.10.10.10 is looking for 10.10.10.12. A, switch A, the backbone edge bridge, will automatically append its source information into the shortest path source ID. So we have the source information. The next thing it will do is append the ICID information, which is basically 1,000, and that is hexed out and placed in to create a complete multicast BMAC address. Notice how now we have all of the information so that B can notice the fact that it needs to replicate. Now what happens is the multicast traffic is sent out over the network and replicated to all points. 10.10.10.12 now sees the broadcast and responds, and I have unicast behavior after that. So that's how we solicitate and support address resolution in the fabric. But obviously, we can't flood things like video surveillance or IP television. We need to have a way to signal these activities and then leverage on the multicast BMAC. So let's talk about the details of what we've done here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a very simple reference diagram. And we're going to kind of replicate what we drew earlier. So we have switch A. We have switch B. We have switch C. And then we have switch D. Kind of reverse them, but you get the, the gist. So now we have these four switches. I am not going to connect these together, however. We're going to assume that they are interconnected, and we could have dozens of switches between these four basic elements. What I want to do is focus on the signaling primitives that make this work. But first, we need a source. So let's have a source at the edge of the network, and that could be a video surveillance camera. It could be a IP television server. It could be a digital signage server. In any event, it is actually generating multicast activity at the edge. And for the sake of argument, let's say that this is multicast group 239 1.1.1.1. Now, typically in a network that's based on protocol independent multicast or PIM, we need to register the source because multicast addresses are always destination address based. Therefore, they're never topologically significant in the network. We have to resolve where the source is located. What we've chosen to do is rather than have something where we register somewhere into the core of the network, we register directly at the outset. So A is the point of registration for this multicast source. Now once the registration happens, A needs to signal out this service to the rest of the network. 
But we also have to have a component for delivery. And that is where we come up with ICETs. Now, an operational aspect of this protocol that you need to understand is that we have vast scalability in ICEDs due to the 24-bit space that we reserve. We have 16,777,215 ICEDs. When you enable multicast on Fabric Connect, the upper level greater than 16 million is automatically reserved for dynamic activity to create these source-based trees for multicast. At that point, they're reserved. They should never be used. As a matter of fact, we prevent them from being used. I mean, if you tried to use anything over 16 million, once you created the service, it would give you an error back and tell you to use something under 16 million. So you still have a lot of scale with the number of ICEs that you have for manually provisioning. But the 777,215 groups now can be utilized to facilitate multicast activity. And that's the important thing to realize at this foundation. But again, I need to have a way to solicit the information. And that's basically where two type length values come in within ISIS. Type length value 185 and 186. Now, the important thing to realize is we have two type length values because of the fact that we have two methods of multicast. The first one is something known as unconstrained multicast. This is something where you're running it on the GRT and you really have no constraints for how far you have to propagate that stream. You're basically running on VRF0. TLV185 focuses on constrained multicast activity. And this is the type of service where you're going to want to lock it down into a constrained domain of interest. Examples of that would be video surveillance, digital signage, medical instrumentation that depends upon multicast. Obviously, we want to constrain those behaviors, and we constrain those behaviors within the scope of the ICID, as we've shown on this side. So we're going to use a constrained notion here. So the first thing that happens is A will look at the source and say, okay, I need to register this. So the first thing it does is it creates an ICID. For the sake of argument, we will say that that multicast ICID is 16 million one. Because it's the first ICID coming up. So 16 million one is what's created. Now that's obviously inside the type length value update of 185. Now, the other thing that we will have is the IP source. And as we've already noted, the IP source is 10.10.10.10. We also need the multicast group. And as we've noted, that is 239.1.1.1.1. And we need one other note. We need a constrained domain. So we need to have the constrained ICID as far as locking this down into a certain community of interest. And using our previous example, we're going to say that that is ICID 1000. So now at this point in time, there is an advertisement of type length value, a triggered, uh, what's known technically as a triggered update. So a triggered update works on the principle that as soon as the source is seen, a registers it and then sends the triggered update through ISIS using type value 185. And at that point, the ISIS update propagates to B, B propagates it out to D, and over to C as well. Now the environment is locked and loaded. If anyone wanted to join 239.1.1.1.1 and they were part of the community of ICID 1000, they would be allowed to join the service. So let's put those pieces in place. Let's put a receiver hanging off of D and a receiver hanging off of C. Now in this instance, use the right letter. Now in this instance, that's all we need is a solicitation from the edge, an IGMP request. And that can be either version one, version two, or version three. And the request would be for 239.1.1.1. Now, once that request is accessed by D, D references its link state database. 
in, this information would be in it, and it would say, okay, you need to get to 239 1.1.1.1. The first thing it asks is, are you part of ICID 1000? If the answer is yes, then it would say, okay, you need ICID 16 million one. At that point, D sends a triggered update, and the ICID now starts to set up a multicast stream, and data begins to flow out to that receiver using ICID 16 million one. But note how ICID 16 million one is constrained inside ICID 1000. If a member from a community from ICID 2000 or any other ICID were to request this group in this semantic, it would be not died. It, it, it simply can't be reachable because they're not part of the constrained community. Now, let's say we have another user that actually makes the IGMP request for the same multicast group. Obviously, the same litmus test has to happen. Are you part of ICID 1000? If the answer is yes, then B would have enough knowledge to say, I need to be the one to do the tandem replication. Therefore, I will replicate ICID 16 million one and provide it to that user community. Now, as you can see, we're using ICIDs to deliver the reverse multicast tree. And we have all of that embedded directly into the multicast BMAC frame so that if I have a failure in any part of this path, I can fail over the service cloud in under 200 milliseconds, which is totally seamless to most video transfers. And you'll see that in a short demonstration that we'll be doing in the near future for you. Now, the other thing to realize is that IGMP actually allows leaving as well. So if, if we were to receive a leave from one of these stations, then the ICID is simply retracted back to the next point of replication. Notice how the ICID is still flowing down to the receiver hanging off of switch C. And then if another receiver came in and actually requested that through IGMP, we would re-extend the ICID out for that new solicitation. This allows a very scalable, stateful delivery mechanism that is inherently secure. Remember, everything here is based on ICIDs. It's Ethernet switched paths. There is no IP in this scenario. There is no dependence on some sort of underlying IP protocol. These are all stateful stealth circuitries with immense separation between service categories, particularly when we use the constrained services behavior. I hope you found this helpful, and I hope that this allows you to have a better understanding of the protocol semantics that we use to drive IP multicast over FabricConnect. I'm Ed Kohler, and thank you for your time.